Elementals have been in Dungeons & Dragons since the game's origin. They are beings composed of the classical elements of fire, earth, air, and water. Though a number of variants and alternative mixings have appeared over the years in the additions. To be specific, there are the base elementals such as fire elemental or earth elemental, and then there are all the other monsters of the elemental creature type. This is similar to how there are the base dragons like red dragons and blue dragons, as well as the general dragon creature type that encompasses other creatures from wyverns to drakes. As with my other monster videos in this series, I will focus primarily on what is presented in the 5th edition books. Elemental creatures have a long-standing history in world mythology and also alchemy. The prominent Renaissance alchemist Paracelsius categorized the four elemental beings as Gnome for Earth, Undyne for Water, Sylph for Air, and Salamander for Fire. As a side note, I first encountered these in one of my very favorite childhood video games, Secret of Mana, in which you must locate each one to receive its magical blessing. Paracelsus developed much of this work from the concepts found in classical antiquity, and I imagine that if we dug deeper, the ancient Greek and Near Eastern elemental ideas are likely rooted in animism, perhaps the oldest of human metaphysical concepts, in that everything has a spirit. Every river, tree, stone, storm, campfire, all has a spirit that gives it a pattern of being. That is what we find in these timeless D&D creatures, the forces of the natural world in their most raw and base states. Primordial energy, animated, given personas even. Do these elemental beings resent the civilizations of the world and all their machinations? Or... Are they impartial forces that exist without much of a stake in the personal lives of mortals? As we are going to see, elementals are often neutral monsters, though there are some trends towards chaos or evil. At times, certain elementals get implicated with demons, and in the 4th edition cosmology, the abyss itself was located at the very bottom of the elemental chaos, where a shard of pure evil had corrupted the lowest reaches of that endless maelstrom. So thus, we get an overview of the spectrum of elementals, from near demonic to beings of raw elemental material and energy, to primal spirits, to some rare humanoid-like elemental hybrids. As usual, I'm going to rank these creatures in tiers F through A and rate their various aspects, from their cool combat abilities to storytelling devices and so on. Before we jump in, if you are not yet subscribed, Take a moment to do so. This bard is on a mission, and I say, join with me, brave adventurers. Let us explore the wild landscapes and perilous ruins in search of treasure and wondrous knowledge. Now we step through the planner gate and enter the elemental plains. I have searched from the sea of fire to the swamp of oblivion, the frost fell to the fountains of creation, and found not a single F-tier elemental. Indeed, we shall encounter our first specimen in mid-D tier. Magmans are the wild vandals of the elemental realm. They are reminiscent of maniacal goblins in a way, but whereas goblins are a race unto themselves, magmans are really just elemental spirits bound into physical form by magic. This is a pretty straightforward monster. It's a chaotic thing like a miniature wildfire or erupting volcano that gleefully darts about setting everything ablaze with its body of lava and flame. Of course, a mage who summons this creature will have control over it, so it's debatable how much destruction these little buggers actually cause. They also are one of the death burst type monsters, along with balors and gas spores, such that when you slay a magman, it explodes in a whoosh of fire. Fire snakes are the juvenile form of salamanders, not the amphibians, but the classic elemental being salamander. Yet it is interesting how an amphibian, a creature so closely connected with water, is associated with fire here. There appear to be various theories and bits stretching all the way back to antiquity about this. One convincing idea is that salamanders in parts of Europe often reside within logs where they can retain their moisture better. When people would bring these logs to their fires for fuel, the salamanders would come scampering out, apparently born out of the flames. D&D runs with the idea of the fire elemental salamander and presents a race of orange and red-scaled beings 
that have a younger or larval stage and an adult stage with a roughly humanoid upper body and a serpentine lower body. So salamanders are associated with the Efreet, that is the fire genies, which if we're going to talk about that, we need to go back to the construction of the city of brass. Ages ago, on the near shores of the Sea of Fire, the Efreet sought to build the most magnificent city in all the plains. The main workforce they hired were the Azers, whom we'll get to shortly. Like dwarves in some respects, the Azers labored diligently until the massive and majestic city was constructed. The Efreet, being the lawful evil tyrants that they are, then decided they wanted to enslave the Azers, seeing them as an inferior race. Also, they became paranoid due to the fact that the Azer builders knew all the secret passageways they constructed throughout the city of Brass. The Efreet failed in their move to dominate the Azers, but succeeded against the Salamanders. Since then, the Salamanders have held animosity against the Azers, blaming them for redirecting the Efreet's tyranny onto the Salamanders. This doesn't make too much sense for me, for if the Efreet had successfully enslaved the Azers, they would have then succeeded even more so in enslaving the salamanders next, so the salamanders would have ended up in this position anyways. But the lore in the Monster Manual remains vague, so there must be some key event or pivotal moment in the story that accounts for all these power games between the fire beings. So the snake itself is a fairly simple monster. It's a youngling of the salamanders with a searing hot body that burns those who touch it or strike it within five feet, much like the Magmen and some others that we're going to see, and it slithers around, biting and whipping with its tail. On the opposite side from fire, we have the Water Weird, which is another simpler type of monster. It's a spirit of elemental water bound into a more specific form through magic. Two interesting notes about this creature. The first is that it itself is neutral aligned. But if it's bound to a holy site like a sacred fountain or a celestial pool, it takes on a good-aligned nature. The same is true for desecrated or unholy water, which creates an evil weird. If the water is cleansed, the water weird reverts back to its neutral alignment. The second point worth noting is that this monster is indistinguishable from water, so while completely submerged, it is invisible. This is one of those cases of permanent or constant passive invisibility that a rare few creatures have. We'll see an even more potent version of this later in the ranking. The Water Weird's melee attack is effective too, as it has a 10-foot reach, it's a water lash that constricts and restrains the target, as well as pulls the target in 5 feet, most likely closer to or even into the body of water. While constricting its foes, the Water Weird primarily attempts to drown them. I seriously doubt how viable this drown option is, however. The player's handbook says a creature can hold its breath a number of minutes equal to 1 plus its constitution modifier, with a minimum of 30 seconds. After this breath runs out, the creature has a number of rounds equal to its con modifier, after which it drops to 0 hit points and is dying. Using this rule, a character with even a con score of 12 can hold his breath for 2 minutes, which equals 20 rounds. It's practically assured that a restrained character will succeed on escaping, or the water weird will crush it to death long before 20 rounds passes. I did a search on world records for underwater breath holding, and there are some very impressive accomplishments here. For competitors who were allowed to hyperventilate on oxygen beforehand, the world record is 22 minutes and 22 seconds for men, and 19 minutes and 33 seconds for women. And for competitions that don't allow the oxygen hyperventilating, the world record is 11 minutes and 35 seconds for men and 8 minutes and 23 seconds for women. So it is possible for people to hold their breath for several minutes. However, they have to train at this for years, and they take many deep breaths before going under instead of just being pulled in by a monster in the midst of battle. And most importantly, they're simply floating, and in fact, they enter a state of slower metabolism and lower heart rate. They're not exerting themselves and depleting oxygen by struggling and fighting, which is one of the most exhausting activities out there. Would I make a house rule to modify the hold your breath rule? Well, maybe. 
We could make it a bit more realistic, perhaps in situations of sudden plunges or intense physical exertion, you use up your breath twice as fast. But I would definitely consider it more before first implementing anything. The rule as is works and it's not too complicated. Where the plane of water meets the plane of air is the frost fell. It's a land of permanent ice and frigid temperatures. A powerful elemental monster that dwells here is the frost salamander. It doesn't appear to be related to the more well-known fire salamander, but there could be a bit of obscure lore that has escaped my research. If any scholars or knowledge domain clerics here could know otherwise, please leave a comment below. The frost salamanders are huge size, so imagine this with about the same mass as an elephant. They have six legs and are fast moving. They're even able to climb up surfaces with ease and most importantly, they can burrow through solid ice and permafrost, creating enormous networks of tunnels and ice caves. In fact, frost giants are sometimes known to capture and tame frost salamanders in order to utilize them as living construction machines, digging and carving giant strongholds. The frost salamanders, while being quite bestial, do have some intelligence, about the same as a typical orc, and they speak primordial, an ancient language of elemental beings that has a number of sub-dialects, such as Ignan for fire, Aquan for water, Auron for air, and Terran for earth. In combat, a frost salamander does about what you would expect. It bites and claws and breathes cones of cold damage. They possess tremor sense as well, which combined with their mobility makes them great as scouts or ambush type combatants. They're also highly attracted to heat, which I can only assume the writers intended this to mean bodily heat, as in the heat of prey. I wish they would have given the frost salamander some kind of special sense to detect heat. In fact, some real world cave salamanders such as the Olm have some amazing sensory organs, allowing them to detect organic matter in water, bioelectricity, and bodily motor movements. The frost salamander's stat block states that they're vulnerable to fire, which means they take double damage from fire, or 50% more damage in my own house rule. But their lore reads as though they are attracted to fire because it leads them to believe there will be people to eat nearby. It also states they might mistake the fire of a forge or a campfire for a large tasty meal, drawing them to attack expeditions and settlements that other predators would avoid which I think could be clarified. Does that mean they might confuse fire for a person? Like up close or at a distance? The stat block also contains the trait Burning Fury, which recharges the Frost Salamander's breath attack if it ever takes fire damage. I suppose the creature goes into a sort of rage if it does get burnt. So the Frost Salamander isn't a terrible monster by any means, but it could have used one more solid edit to improve and clarify some things. Just remember, my brave companions, if you ever come across a large ice tunnel out in the frozen tundra, keep a sharp lookout for frost salamanders. I had wanted the elemental myrmidons to come after the base elementals, firstly because they build upon the standard elementals, and secondly because I had hoped they would be a little better overall. But to be honest, I think they actually fall slightly behind. So what we have here are the four baseline elementals bound into suits of plate armor and equipped with weapons, and of course they are summoned into existence by magic. Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes gives the elemental myrmidons only a single small paragraph of lore, and we'll assume that they're following the same lore as the base elementals behind this. For anyone curious about the word Myrmidon, it comes to us from Greek mythology in which they were a nation of people. In the Iliad by Homer, Achilles leads Myrmidon soldiers. Seen from another angle, in classical Greek, the word Myrmidon means ant people. And later, in the year 8 AD, the great Roman poet Ovid produced his timeless work Metamorphoses, which describes Myrmidons as worker ants that inhabited the island of Aegina. The name also reminds me of Mermillo or Murmillo, a class of gladiator in ancient Rome who used a gladius and armored arm on one side and a big rectangular shield on the other and wore the stylish crested mask helm. I don't know if Myrmidon and Mermillo are related, it might just be me. 
Comparing the elemental myrmidons' mechanics to the typical elementals is where we see them lag behind a tiny bit. Their ACs and hit points are higher, but their attacks are not particularly more powerful, and are actually a little less strong in a couple cases. Really, their attacks are more straightforward, and they don't have quite the variety and the uniqueness as the base elementals. The air Myrmidon wields a flail, can fly, has a lightning flail strike that can stun. The earth Myrmidon wields a maul and has a thunder strike that can knock targets prone. The fire Myrmidon wields two scimitars, sheds light, and is susceptible to water. It can also make these fiery blade strikes. The water Myrmidon wields a trident, can swim, and can make freezing strikes that slow down the target. None of it's bad, but neither is it all that great. It's very straightforward. They lack just the cool abilities and the great mobility that we're going to see with the baseline elementals. A potential opportunity with the Myrmidons lies in their higher intelligence score. It's nearing that of a human's. They could have been a race of their own, maybe one originally created by the evil genies or power-hungry spellcasters, but they managed to break free and form their own multi-elemental stronghold city, and they discovered the secret of how to create more of their kind or even reproduce. They could have goals and true sentience, along with variants like the Air Myrmidon Windmaster that can bind flying creatures to the ground, the Earth Myrmidon Stonecaller who calls up stone walls that separate and block off enemy combatants, a Fire Myrmidon Pyrovore that consumes both mundane and magical fire and grows in size and power as he does, a Water Myrmidon Aquamancer that traps foes within spheres of water, or they could have brought back the Elemental Archons from 4th edition, which were intelligent elemental beings created by the Primordials as a soldier race. The possibilities are many, and while the Myrmidons, as is, do make nice elemental guards for spellcasters or magic shop owners, it would have been great for them to go further and truly be something special. Here we have D tier. Simple monsters with sparks of interesting bits here and there, but overall too limited or too lacking to hold our attention for long. In C tier, we tread closer to the grander and more astonishing of elemental beings. Ready your spells of protection from energy, lest you find yourself scorched and frozen. D&D doesn't have a lot of creatures whose names begin with the letter X. The Zorn is one of them. I will admit that I've always ignored this guy, and I'm trying to understand why that is. Zorns are peculiar creatures from the plane of Earth, with three arms and three legs, stony bodies, and big mouths that open directly on top of their bodies. They have tremor sense and earth glide like the standard earth elemental, stone camouflage that helps them hide in rocky terrain, and a three-claw, one-bite multi-attack. What makes them unique beyond their strange bodies and the X name is the fact that their diets consist of gems and precious metals. They actually have a treasure sense trait that allows them to smell such rare minerals in the same way that a bloodhound sniffs out quarry. Zorns are not particularly well known because they are neutral creatures that prefer to stick to their native plane, leading simple lives of eating precious stones and gold and the like. Unlike a rust monster, the Zorn does not have any actual mechanic that allows them to quickly devour objects, but I imagine they can probably gulp down quite a mouthful with the incredibly wide maws they have. I suppose I've never paid the Zorns much attention because they don't call much attention to themselves. They are intelligent, sentient beings that speak Terran, but their motivations are really quite simple. Would a group of more aggressive Zorns attack a party of adventurers just to try to eat their treasure? Maybe? I guess so? I don't know. They're not a badly designed monster per se, but something's missing here. The Fire Newts are not technically elementals, but they are close enough, so I had to include them in this ranking. They are orange to red-skinned amphibious humanoids that live in hot, wet places, like natural hot springs or volcanic rainforest, steam caves, whatever else we can imagine in a world of fantasy. They're not only immune to fire, but they need both high heat and water in order to function well. Something tells me that they would get along well with some steam methods. The Fire Newts worship Imix, the Fire Lord, one of the evil Elder Elementals, or Primordials if you prefer. 
The Fire Newt Society is a military religious one, and all customs flow from the might of Imix. The Fire Newts are adept at alchemy and are known to habitually chew a paste created from flammable compounds, which this gives them the ability to spit fire. Unfortunately, their lore and their stat blocks in Volo's Guide to Monsters give us no other information about further alchemical creations. Not even a sidebar with a couple additional options. They just shoot fire like so many other fire creatures. It works, but it's nothing special. The Fire Newts are also known to breed and train giant striders, not to be confused with steeders. The striders are their avian reptilian mounts, considered to be a gift from almighty Imex. The Fire Newts are overall a pretty decent monstrous race with close ties to elementals. They have enough versatility to be central players in a region or a campaign arc, and like many 5th edition monsters, could easily get more entries that show us the variant roles and classes in their society. Gargoyles are a monster that I have really enjoyed my entire life. I remember taking a tour in a little local castle when I was a young child, which had a number of gargoyles and other imposing statuary. They really frightened me, and going into the basement area particularly gave me an eerie and foreboding sense that I'll never forget. This memory is also somehow connected to Jim Henson's The Storyteller, in particular, the tale known as The Soldier in Death, the scene in which the main character enters the castle where the little devils dwell and he gambles with them. It used to freak me out, but I also used to love it. And as I write this, I suspect that that scene brought back the spooky feeling I had in the castle. Well, gargoyles were originally created to scare and ward off evil spirits, so I suppose they accomplished what they were intended for. As a quick side note, this gargoyle miniature from the 2008 Dungeons of Dread set might be the biggest medium-sized D&D mini I've ever seen. If anyone knows of a bigger mini for a medium creature, please leave me a comment about that. It's somewhat strange to me that gargoyles in D&D are elementals. I mean, it does work, but I would think they would be monstrosities or maybe even fiends. It's also odd that they are chaotic and not lawful, as they are patient, disciplined, dedicated, they watch over a certain location for long periods, even remaining perfectly motionless like statues for years at a time. And they are also known to serve masters. There is a sidebar of lore that gargoyles are created unintentionally by the elder elemental Ogrimach as he leaves shards of broken rock in his wake that are infused with his spite towards creatures of air. It's pretty cool lore, I suppose, but why for gargoyles? As in the stony beasts that guard cathedrals and castles of old. I would have made Ogrimach's stony spawn some other unique elemental creature of their own, then take the gargoyle in a classic direction and develop their own interesting lore. But that's D&D for you, a game in which this is a Lamia, and this is a Gorgon. That's right, I've come across a second of these metal-plated bulls in my hometown of Wichita, Kansas. A lot of what appeals to me about gargoyles is their style, because their mechanics are fairly simple. They fly and make basic bite and claw attacks. Oh, and they appear as statues when remaining motionless, though any adventurer who sees a gargoyle is going to suspect that it's probably more than just a statue. They have a number of resistances and immunities, like most all elementals do, and I really wish they had more than that. The gargoyles in Magic the Gathering often suffer similarly, as it's rare that we see one that's really worth a damn mechanics-wise. It's a shame, because the gargoyle is essentially such a cool and evocative monster. Another monster I've overlooked for years is the Flail Snail. I guess I always thought it looked too cheesy. But after giving it an honest chance, I really warmed up to it. To start off with, there does appear to be some historical roots for this monster. Lots of late medieval manuscripts feature knights fighting snails in the margin images. Sometimes these snails are of giant proportions, sometimes not. There are a number of theories about what these drawings represent, which is actually beyond the scope of this video, but it's a curious topic to read about. The Flail Snail of Dungeons & Dragons is another earth elemental type creature. It slugs around, slow as can be, eating all minerals in its path. Rock, dirt, sand, crystal deposits. 
The slimy snail trail it leaves behind eventually solidifies into glass, which can be reformed into virtually any glass object, from windows to potion vials to glass art. Some daring and opportunistic hunters specifically follow flail snails in order to collect this substance. Others try to capture and sell the flail snails themselves. If threatened, the creature releases a burst of radiant scintillations from its shell, creating a glare that imposes disadvantage on attack rolls and potentially stunning targets within 30 feet. As effective as this action can potentially be, it only lasts for a round and doesn't recharge until the snail takes a short or long rest. The snail's other action, of course, is to barrage an enemy with its five flail tentacles. If the snail takes 10 or more damage on a turn, one of the tentacles is destroyed. If all of its tentacles die, it retracts into its shell, releasing a loud wail for 5d6 minutes before dying. While inside its shell, the snail gains plus 4 to armor class. The snail's shell is even more interesting, as it has anti-magic properties. It has resistance against spells, and spell attacks suffer disadvantage against the snail. If it succeeds on a saving throw against a spell, or a spell attack misses it, its shell can potentially reflect the spell back to the caster, or even release a wave of force damage. These are some really interesting mechanics, and after reading them, I greatly want to use a flail snail in a dungeon. Unsurprisingly, I do think this monster comes up short in certain aspects. It is so, so slow, with a speed of a mere 10 feet. If it doesn't have the benefit of terrain that blocks long-range attacks, this monster is absolutely doomed. You would think that as compensation, the flail snail would have a very high AC and hit points, being a more defense-based creature, but its AC is a moderate 16, and its hit points are somewhat low at 52. If it can somehow manage to get within melee reach of an enemy, and manage to hit with all five of its flail tentacles, it does somewhat high damage, but it's just too unreliable. Even the Spell Reflection or Force Blast has a 33% chance of not functioning. Why create a monster with such cool and useful effects, but then design them with a one-third chance not to work? The snail could also use a climb speed and perhaps ignore difficult terrain. With a solid edit and a little tune-up, this monster could function really well. The final noteworthy bit is how the flail snail's shell is highly valuable. In fact, it's so valuable that it seems too much for this really slow, low-level monster. It's odd how a CR3 creature has a shell that's valued at 5,000 gold pieces, which can be made into a potent spell-resisting magic shield. Actually, shields. That's right, shields. A single flail snail's shell can provide enough material to craft three spell guard shields. Alrighty then. And now we come to the elementals. I mean, the elemental elementals. The original, pure form, baseline, primordial creatures. Are they spirits? Are they energy? Are they base components of matter given form by magic? However you want to portray them, these creatures go back to the beginning of existence in the D&D world, and indeed, the D&D game itself. Like with the Myrmidons, there is no need for me to separate them into four different entries, as each is statistically just as good or viable as the others. They all have a basic slam attack, as well as a host of resistances and immunities due to their elemental forms. For example, you can't poison them or put them to sleep. The air elemental has incredibly fast flying speed, the ability to fit through tiny crevices, and a really cool whirlwind attack. The earth elemental can glide right through natural stone and dirt. It has the siege monster trait and tremor sense. The fire elemental can also fit through tiny openings. It can even move into other creatures' spaces and burn them and set them on fire. The water elemental as well can flow through the narrowest of cracks and a whelm attack, which is like a whirlpool that restrains targets while battering them about and submerging them in water. These elementals are really great because of their potent, thematically flavorful actions, 
because of their unique forms of mobility and because of their particular resistances and vulnerabilities. They have certain quirks due to their purely element-based forms, such as the fire elemental being harmed and hindered by water and the water elemental being affected by cold. Like many other kinds of elementals, their low attributes come in the realm of role-playing, lore, and versatility. These monsters really don't have much in the way of backgrounds, or ecologies, or personalities, or goals. They're either temporary manifestations in a location of elemental power, or they are conjurations created by spellcasters. I do think this is appropriate, as it fills an important role in the grand cosmology of everything. But from an objective standpoint, I do recognize that this holds them back from the higher tiers. I also miss the mixed elementals of 4th edition. Both Monster Manual 1 and 2 of 4e had a number of creatures that blended two elements together to create some previously unseen monsters. Fire Lasher was a flaming whirlwind, Rockfire Dreadnought was composed of magma and stone, Earthwind Ravenger was made of rocks and air, sort of reminiscent of the Storm Atronach from the Elder Scrolls. Thunderblast Cyclone was a churning gale of mist and lightning and thunder. There were also the Chillfire Destroyer, Dust Devil, Flame Spiker, Geonid, Mud Lasher, Rock Fist Smasher, Shardstorm Vortex, Stormstone Fury, Tempest Whist, Wind Fiend Fury, and Wind Striker. <gasps> as well as the Chaos Shards, which were elemental magical beasts of living crystal that rose out of the border plane between the elemental chaos and the abyss. As I go through these 4th edition elementals, I'm reminded so much of Magic the Gathering, which often uses these compound word names that sometimes border on cheesy, but really, we could spend an entire huge video looking at the fabulous elementals of Magic the Gathering, and many of them could be converted into D&D monsters. Back to the standard elementals of 5th edition, putting them in low C tier was as much as I could manage. You could make a good argument that they should actually be in high D tier, but nonetheless, I have to give a nod of respect to these most classic of creatures. Oh, the methods! What fun creatures these are! It's interesting that I already mentioned Jim Henson because the Mephits always reminded me of Muppets, eccentric, quirky, impish things that combine elements together. The Dust Mephit is air and earth, ice is air and water, magma is earth and fire, mud is earth and water, smoke is air and fire, steam is fire and water. Each has a couple of special abilities and or traits. They can all fly, they can claw, and they all explode in a death burst upon reaching zero hit points. They are mischievous things, sometimes cruel or maybe just uncaring of mortal sensibilities. Though in a fantasy world of demons and undead, the methods are nowhere near the most wicked of beings. For the very low level monsters that they are, they aren't too simplistic. The methods really are great. They can swoop through the air overhead using blinding breath or sleep or heat metal or other abilities that are really quite effective in the early game. And for me, acting out their various personalities is endlessly entertaining. Someone has broken into our lair again. Those damned adventurers should just leave us be. Someone has broken into our lair again. Why don't you do something about it, mud puddle? I'll steam the meat off their bones. That is, after you soften them up and knock them out first. Well, hurry up and get on it. I've never seen meat steamed off a person before. I wonder what that smells like. The Elder Elementals are probably the most extremely lopsided monsters I've reviewed yet, due to their astonishing abilities and epic style, but only bare bones lore and really nothing in the way of social interaction or even versatility. In a way, the Mephits are a better monster because they're so accessible, contrasted with the end-game Elder Elementals. How often are you going to use these mega-high CR Elementals of Apocalypse? It's likely that they would probably just be lurking behind the scenes, a threat that the adventurers are trying to prevent from appearing in the world throughout the course of a campaign. 
The reason why these tremendous elementals are so low in role-playing is because they aren't actually beings. You know, they don't have personalities or goals, they don't care about anything. Their intelligence level is just that of a beast. Leviathan is no smarter than a crocodile. Phoenix is no smarter than a regular hawk. They're more like forces of nature, or more specifically, forces of the elements. These primordial behemoths essentially represent energy masses that have consumed and absorbed lesser elementals on their home plane for centuries until becoming megastorms in roughly the shapes of creatures. Elder elementals have only ever appeared in the world when cults of the Elder Elemental Eye have come into possession of secret rights to summon them. In fact, only the most extreme of such cultists would even attempt such a nihilistic feat because calling in an Elder Elemental means that you're bringing cataclysm to the land. Four Elder Elementals are presented in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. Leviathan appears as a titanic sea serpent of water. It churns the seas, devastates ships, smashes coasts. It has a tidal wave ability, which probably should be called Tsunami. It creates a wave that's 250 feet long, 250 feet high, 50 feet thick. It bludgeons and carries away everything in its path. Only the most extraordinarily strong swimmers have a chance of being able to swim out of this maelstrom. Phoenix is the iconic giant firebird that dies in a burst of flame and is later reborn. In combat, it swoops about, biting and raking with talons, burning everything as it goes. Elder Tempest looks like a massive multi-winged serpent composed of storms. It flies like none other, unleashing lightning storms and gales of mile-long wind and thunder. Zaratan is as a walking hill, turtle-like in shape. It quakes the very ground as it walks, sending shock waves of thunder damage. It knocks creatures prone as it goes, collapses buildings. It can bite, stomp, spit rocks, spew volleys of rubble or, if needed, retract into its shell and recover hit points. There are a lot to these creatures mechanically, and each one of them comes with an array of resistances, legendary actions, and the one thing that saves DMs from losing all faith in boss monsters, legendary resistance. Their challenge ratings range from 16 up to 23, making them deadly for all but high-level parties. The lore presented in the books does not state how long they remain once summoned, but given the implications of kingdom-wide or maybe even worldwide devastation, it seems that they remain summoned until they are slain, or at least long enough to threaten the extinction of an entire realm. Now we come across the full-fledged salamander, a large-sized elemental being that has a long, snake-like lower body and a humanoid-like upper body. It's covered in flame-colored hide and a multitude of different frills. Their bodies generate immense heat, and adventurers who touch salamanders or strike them at close range get singed by this. The heat radiates into the salamander's weapons, and its standard attack is to strike a target with its tail, grab and constrict it, while piercing it with a spear or a trident. The target is burning the whole time. The weakness of the salamander is, of course, cold damage, so that might factor into an encounter in an interesting way. As we learned already, the salamanders are ruled over by the tyrannical Ifrit, and this domineering way in turn influences the salamanders themselves, who rank up in corrupted hierarchies of power. There are bands of nomadic salamanders as well, who wander the plain of fire and the nearby regions, but the noble salamanders of higher status within the city of Brass still claim to have authority over the nomads. One of the primary skills that salamanders are known for is smithing. In fact, since they're capable of generating such extreme heat, they have little need for forges, and instead heat up steel sufficiently using only their hands and tools. This fire creature as metal smith archetype is echoed as well in the fire giants, as well as the azers, which we now come to. At first glance, you would call an Azer a fire dwarf, but this resemblance is superficial only, as Azers are not a race of breeding, flesh and blood people. They're actually made of metal and stone, magma and fire. They're created by others of their kind and infused with sparks of elemental spirits that give each individual Azer sentience. Azers dwell in the volcanic border region between the plane of fire and the plane of earth. 
Given their method of creation, their populations grow at a slow rate. Their societies are organized and structured, based largely around production, industry, defense. Indeed, Azers are never at a loss for foes, mainly the Efreet, the fire genies. And if we'll remember that in ages past, the Efreet enlisted the Azers to construct the glorious city of Brass, then moved to enslave and control them. Though the Azers did escape victorious, or at least not defeated, the struggle could have gone far worse. And you can bet that Azers and Efreet have come into other conflicts over the centuries, and likely will again. Mechanically, the standard Azer is nothing all too interesting. It has that same heated body trait as the Salamander and the Magmen. It sheds illumination due to its fiery beard and hair, but otherwise it just makes basic weapon attacks that deal an additional 1d6 of fire damage. Its strong points lie in aesthetics and its more story and ecology-based aspects. Being a full sentient race of its own gives it a lot of space to work with in various types of scenes or story elements of an entire game. Checking back quickly with the Fire Newt, we have the Warlock of Imix. Warlocks in 5th edition unfortunately don't make the best NPCs in combat due to their limited spell slots. Only casting two spells in an encounter and then being resigned to Eldritch Blasting is not exactly the most enjoyable type of spellcaster for a DM to run. Story-wise, they can be great though. And the Warlock class itself is really so flavorful. It's filled with lots of great hooks. Mechanically, I think it needs a slight bit of improvement, but again, story-wise, I think it's great. So in the great dedication to the Primordial Imix, Certain favored fire newts have arcane powers gained from their lord. The cantrips and spells do give this monster some amount of variety and some interesting options to draw upon, but in true C-tier form, it leaves something to be desired. For example here, the fire newt warlock can see through magical darkness, but it doesn't actually know the darkness spell. This monster could have easily been B-tier if its spells had more variety and synergy, but instead the designers just gave it four direct damage fire spells. Bleh. Here is a very unique monster. In fact, the only that in both 1st and 2nd edition monster manuals had just a blank space for its artwork. The Wizards of the Coast designers figure that, while it is amusing and actually fitting, people do like to see the monster art. And besides, for those who can see invisibility, they have to see something. An invisible stalker is a type of air elemental conjured and empowered through, of course, rare magic rituals. I swear, the D&D books are filled with these vague references to mysteries and secrets and arcane esoterica, but we never see anything specific. What does someone have to do? Does the summoner have to locate the lost Temple of Titan's Breath, make it past the magical wards and bound guardians, then to the chamber in the High Fane to sacrifice a Genasi prince, and burn a satchel of white opium in a brazier while chanting phrases in the Aran tongue by the hurricane farts of Akadi? Give me the juicy details. So, an invisible stalker is what you would imagine. It can be seen no more than you can see air or wind. It flies expediently wherever its conjuring master commands, perhaps as an assassin or as a thief. Even more so, once the invisible stalker is given a target, it knows not only the location of its summoner, but also the direction and distance of its quarry, as long as the two are on the same plane of existence. The stalker has many resistances and immunities, as do most elementals along with expertise in perception and stealth. It also has a precise attack due to the fact that it's probably always going to be attacking with advantage, but its damage output is fairly low. Overall, I do consider this monster to be pretty cool and of course a very unique one. I've always enjoyed invisible stalkers whenever I've used them in my own campaigns, and their role as elemental assassin thieves serving a master works well for many purposes. When my home group was only 4th level, they were making their way through one of the many labyrinths in Bazagon, the City of Mazes. They came across a crying boy and talked with him. He was a little 8-year-old noble and extremely upset that the party had killed his pet, a basilisk the party had slain just earlier on. The boy was furious and throwing a tantrum, saying that Mr. Fingers is gonna get you, 
My parents say he's just my imaginary friend, but he's real. You'll see. The party laughed off this odd brat until they suddenly found themselves under assault by an invisible foe. They quickly realized that this monster was going to pummel them all to dust if they didn't use the right combination of tactics. The drow ranger cast fairy fire, revealing the form of Mr. Fingers, the invisible stalker. The arcane archer hit it with a magic shot that banished it to another plane, and the bard deceived the boy, saying that if he didn't call off his friend's attack, the party would leave it banished to the nether realm forever. The bluff worked, and a round later, the invisible stalker reappeared, as it would have anyway, and the party hightailed it away from the creepy kid. At the top of C tier is the Galabdur, another monster which I overlooked for quite some time, until a certain adventure to a mountain shrine I created in 4th edition, when I realized how interesting these rocky monsters actually are. Some Galabdurs are summoned from the plane of Earth by conjurers, but others occur spontaneously in the world, or perhaps other places, in areas that are touched by the energy of the plane of Earth. While crouched down, a Galabdur appears just like an ordinary rock or a boulder. They're often guardians and keepers of places with elemental or primal power. A ring of standing stones, for example, or a sacred mountain. They're connected to the earth all around. They can even animate two boulders up to a minute per day. The Galabdur and the boulders go rolling and crashing into enemies, dealing bludgeoning damage and knocking the targets prone. A Galabdur is a neutral aligned creature by default, and it embodies something similar to what we saw with the stone giant. A calm, patient, dedicated dweller in stone. Even more than a giant, because a Galabdur can live for a very, very long time. Without the need for sustenance like most mortal beings, it can rest and observe for years, decades, even longer, possibly even collecting a wealth of knowledge from all that it has seen over time. This is a nice detail. It gives the Galabdur the potential to serve as a wise man, a lore keeper, a guide. It's not an amazing monster, but it doesn't try to be. For mid-tier creatures, the Galabdur is a solid entry. Seriously, don't take him for granted. C-tier was the most populous one for the elementals, and I believe it has been so for all of the other monster types. What does that mean exactly? Does the game favor monsters that aren't too complex? Maybe the designers are leery about some lurking danger and trying to make everything too cool. Or does it simply mean that average is average for a reason? B tier is even slimmer when it comes to elementals. In fact, we only have a single entry here. And it's another creature that, like the Fire Newt, if you want to get very, very technical, you could say it's not an elemental in the strictest definition of the word. Genasi are a race of elemental-infused humanoids. They're sort of half-elementals, though I don't recall ever reading that specific term anywhere. Like with other human mixed with something else races, such as half-orc, half-elf, and tiefling, the Genasi has a dual parentage, one being a human or maybe other common humanoid, and the other being a genie. This leads me to believe that Genasi are a fairly rare race overall, but I like the idea of a Genasi community that's in an obscure part of the world or maybe even in the city of Brass. A Genasi varies quite a bit depending upon which element he's associated with. The base Genasi all get plus two constitution, only that, and each sub-race builds from there. Air Genasi get plus one to dexterity, endless breath holding, and levitate once per day. Earth Genasi get plus one strength, they are unhindered by difficult terrain of dirt or stone, and they can cast pass without trace once per day. Fire Genasi get plus one to intelligence, dark vision, fire resistance, the produce flame cantrip, and burning hands once per day. And Water Genasi get plus one to wisdom, water breathing, a swim speed, acid resistance, the control water cantrip, and create or destroy water once per day. There's a lot of options there, and most of them are quite good for different types of player characters or NPCs. A Genasi resembles the race of his humanoid parent, 
but with skin and eyes that are colored like the associated element. And then under certain intense situation, even more minor bits of the element itself manifest from the Genasi's body, like flashes of fieriness or puffs of misty cloud. The Genasi is the race most often depicted with the energy lines effects over their bodies, which you might love or hate, it kind of depends on your own tastes. For my campaigns personally, the Genasi work well in the very high fantasy world where almost anything goes, but they do not work in my low fantasy world where they would clash with the more realistic style or the medieval type setting. To give some examples here, going from low to high fantasy, a Genasi would never appear in the world of Conan or Game of Thrones. They probably wouldn't make it into Middle Earth. They might make it into Harry Potter. They likely could exist in the Elder Scrolls, and they absolutely would be a race in World of Warcraft and in most anime. Probably the best aspect of the Genasi is their very high versatility attribute. If we get past their underdeveloped lore, we have an incredibly varied race that is primed to be anything and do anything. I could feature Genasi throughout an entire campaign and do so much with them. I also remember the Abyssal Genasi from 4th edition, again drawing from that bordering of elemental chaos and the Abyss, which this gave us some variant sub-races, Void Soul, Cinder Soul, Caustic Soul, and Plague Soul and this could add even an extra layer of grit and versatility. So, thumbs up to the Genasi, but they won't fit into every setting. And just so, we arrive at A tier of the elementals of D&D. The majestic palaces of the city of Brass greet us with a thousand wonders, and the lordly inhabitants here are at once bewildering and mighty. The top status for elemental races is the genie. They are legendary beings that have thrilled and captivated us since the early ages of yore. While the Elder Elementals are indeed greater in terms of raw power, they're merely forces. They have the barest semblance of personality. But genies, these are actual beings, souls, minds, and all. They are the true masters of the Elemental Planes. In real world myth, the genie, or jinn, traces back to early Arabian mythology, which itself drew influence from several cultures that it came into contact with, from the Mediterranean to the Far East. Genies are powerful spirits, not demons because they're not entirely evil, but not angels because they're also not entirely good. The word jinn, or singular jinni, is connected with the Latin word genius, and the Aramaic word genia. Its meaning can be understood as to hide, as well as tutor deity or guiding spirit. The ancient Romans had a different take on the word genius. In classical times, a person wasn't a genius, but rather had a genius. A spirit that helped thinkers and artists by giving them ideas and inspiration and life guidance. A genius was something between the voice of your conscience and the muse that gives you the passion of creative energy. This concept goes even further back to ancient Greece with their belief in daemons, which was essentially borrowed or absorbed later on by Rome. Eventually, in more recent eras, genius came to mean the actual person gifted with great intellect or artistic ability. Yet we cannot deny the allure of the classic tale of the genie and the magic lamp and that rogue Aladdin. The genie is a being of immense power. It promises to grant wishes, yet simultaneously it is hidden and bound within the confines of the lamp. And there is the ever-present fear that in misusing our wishes, we shall meet our doom. What is the greatest and best thing that one can wish for? Well, that is a question of various opinions. What might appeal to your ego today could prove to be disastrous for those around you tomorrow. In the D&D world, genies are a race unto themselves, administrating their society with their own castes and levels of dominance. Genies do not mate to produce more of their kind, but rather they are formed when a high-powered sentient being fuses with the primordial substance of the elemental planes. 
When a genie does want children, he or she produces with a humanoid, creating a genasi. While the genies are all tremendous creatures to be sure, it is only rarely that a genie is powerful enough to grant wishes. The Monster Manual describes them as roughly humanoid creatures whose lower bodies often dissipate into a trail of elemental motes. They are nobles, slave drivers, haughty and conceited beings, too proud to worship the gods, and at times even fancying themselves to be gods, demanding mortals worship them. They lavish in riches and opulence, and again we get the all-too-common vague wordings, stating that their vast palaces overflow with wonders and sensory delights beyond imagination. But what exactly are such things? As Han Solo put it, I can imagine a lot. And besides, wouldn't constant extreme luxury get boring? We crave challenge, struggle, unknown, adventure. The Monster Manual goes on to claim few creatures except the gods and other genies can challenge their power. Oh, is that so? What about dragons, archdevils, demon lords, great old ones, elder primal spirits, titans, archfey, high level player characters? The genies of the Monster Manual are only CR 11. A gray render is a high CR than this. Or is it that this part is referring just to the most powerful of noble genies, the ones with the ability to cast Wish, the ones which we have no stat block entries for? And how do powerful spellcasters bind genies to their service? There doesn't appear to be any such spell or ritual in the game. Is it just the domain of a DM's storytelling or home crafting? Even the spell Conjure Elementals, cast at a ninth level spell slot, can only summon up to a CR9 elemental, still two CR short of the CR11 genies, which aren't even the most powerful of genie kind. Anyhow, moving on to the traits of genies, we find four types. Dao are the neutral evil earth genies. They are the greediest, coveting precious metals, gems, jewelry, slave workers, and more. They can walk, fly, burrow, and earth glide. They have a number of innate spells, often earth-themed, such as stone shape, pass wall, move earth, conjure earth elemental, and wall of stone. They also have other magic, such as invisibility and plane shift, which can target other creatures, by the way. Their preferred weapon in melee combat is a maul, but we're going to have to look past the World of Warcraft-style art, particularly the ridiculously oversized weapon. No offense to the artist here, I'm sure they were simply going by the requested art direction. I have to chuckle about the Dao's trait, sure-footed. It gives the Dao advantage on strength and dexterity saving throws against being knocked prone. But why is it this way? Just give the Dao advantage on all strength and dex saves, or just give them immunity to being knocked prone. As it is, it's too fiddly piddly for a creature as mighty as a genie. Efreet are lawful evil fire genies. They somewhat resemble fiends, or maybe even oni physically. Fittingly, they are the cruelest of the genies, viewing all other creatures as either potential slaves or as enemies. Throughout the plains, the Efreet raid for captives and servants to bring back to their palaces of black glass and basalt that are built aside pools of flame. The Efreet's long-standing and hated rivals are the Merids. They, of course, have flame spells in addition to the standard genie spells such as tongues, gaseous form, and again invisibility and plane shift. And Afridi's typical weapons are a burning scimitar and thrown flame. Merids are the chaotic neutral water genies. While not as wicked as Dao or Afrit, they are still egotistical bastards and think of themselves as above all other creatures in existence. They are the lords of all realms, aquatic and beyond, so they say. A particular detail that I personally appreciate is that Merids are some of the greatest storytellers in all the plains. They have a fish-like physical appearance and they can swim very fast as well as walk and fly. Their innate spells are water-themed, but otherwise resemble the Daos and the other genies. They fight with tridents and intense blasts of water that pummel and throw back opponents. 
Jin are chaotic good air genies and the least likely to be complete assholes. In fact, they are the only elemental creature that I can find in all of 5th edition that is good aligned. They believe that fate plays a central role in the destiny of each being, even if it means having a subservient role. They typically don't have slaves so much as servants and staff members who are shown affection and dignity. And Jin are also known to aid mortals from time to time. I would say that they are my personal pick for the best of all four genie types. They relate so well to the tale of Aladdin from A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. And they also possess, in addition to their spells, a fantastic create whirlwind ability. They also use scimitars in melee, which not only slash, but also channel thunder and lightning from the djinn itself. What a fantastic and deserving monster to cap off this ranking. Overall, the elemental creature type is not as big as others, such as undead or monstrosities, but they're an important type of monster, foundational really. They harken back to the origin of all things, yet they remain so relevant as the classical four elements continue on as powerful archetypes. Furthermore, so many spells in the game are connected to the elements, from create and destroy water to conjure elemental to staples like fireball and lightning bolt. I felt a real sense of energy as I went through these entries, and I hope your own inspiration has been infused with the raw power of these creatures and their realm of primordial energy. I do have another quick announcement. I am in the process of revamping and enhancing the maps on my Patreon page. My intention is to not only improve the art quality, but to make them more friendly to at-home printing. For those of you who are unfamiliar, I make dungeon maps and battle maps. One each month is actually released for free, and for those that are pledged patrons, you get the whole three map set. You can print them at home on multiple sheets or at a print service on the big 24 by 36 inch sheets. Or, of course, you can use them online. They're black and white to keep down printing costs and to give it an old school hand-drawn style. And they're created for dynamic encounters that have an interesting flow to them. I also release a monthly newsletter and create custom monsters from my patrons' concepts. So go take a look and enjoy. I do want to give a word of sincere appreciation to all my patrons, in particular, Warser, Adam Wood, Dennis Cropper, Vince the Fallen Demon, and Nick the Pirate King. These guys and I have a live stream campaign here on my YouTube channel that is typically every other Sunday evening at 7 Central, 8 Eastern. It is one of the very best campaigns I've ever had the pleasure to run, full of so much role playing, story development, and of course, tense encounters. This is Esper. Thank you all for watching, and until next time, may your adventures be many.